Okay, now that we've talked about schedules of reinforcement, the next topic to discuss is what factors affect schedules or what if affects schedule performance and combinations of schedules because as it turns out very few researchers are now studying those four basic schedules or those individual schedules. We have now have combinations that we think illustrate other features of the environment and experience and of learning that are better, uh, better things to study and, and can have some um, applications to the human condition and so on. To start with though, uh, what we need to, what I need to set up is this point of what are we measuring or what are we studying and um, in behavior analysis it, we, Skinner made an argument that, and I agree with, that the fundamental unit of behavior is rate, that is responses per minute or responses per hour. And this was an important distinction. It's not whether we could study whether something happens or not, but um, what we really are going to study is uh, how fast something happens or how or fre frequently it happens. Um, this is really applicable just to the free operant case, um, which is the animal's free to respond versus the discrete trial case, which is you constrain the behavior by uh, the number of uh, chances that an animal has. So in the free operant uh, case, we argue that response rate is the fundamental unit. And you can, an analogy of this is if you were stopped by a policeman, it really doesn't matter to the policeman how many miles you've driven. What, what's important is, uh, what's critical to him or what's important to him is how many miles you, you drive per hour, what your, what your speed is, not that you drove, you've been driving for four hours or that you drove 100 miles, but what's important is that you drove 100 miles per hour. Likewise, when we think about the free operant uh, uh, situation and case and schedule, we're going to be studying how often behavior occurs, its rate of responding. So what affects response rate? Well, the first answer to the question is schedule. Obviously, the schedule type affects response rate. The steepness of the cumulative record is going to show us when we have fast responding versus slow responding, and we know to begin with that schedule affects that. Generally speaking, ratios are uh, produce greater or higher responding than intervals, and the ratio or interval size is an important effect as well. It's what we refer to as the richness of the schedule, how often it pays off. And the higher the payoff, the higher the rate, generally speaking. Although there are some limits because we can, uh, as we can see, that very rich schedules often um, slow down rate of responding. If we're talking about something like an animal responding for food, they'll get full and then the food isn't a reinforcer anymore and that slows rate. When we talk about uh, one of the primary effects of rate of responding on rate of responding is rate of reinforcement. So and that is how often do, does reinforcement occur. In ratio schedules, generally what we find is that variable schedules produce higher rates than fixed of equal value. So if we were to compare a VR20 versus an FR20, we would expect the VR20 to, to uh, uh, produce a higher rate of responding. Smaller values generally produce higher rates of responding than larger values. So, for example, a VR20 would probably produce a higher rate than a VR100, although that may not be always the case. This, this relationship sometimes depends. And the interval schedules, a variable interval, generally produces higher rates of responding than a fixed. So a VI30 is going to be higher than an FI30. And smaller value, again, larger value, um, a VI30 will, will generally produce higher rates of responding than a VI150. Interestingly, though, an FR1, which is the richest of all schedules, that's a continuous reinforcement schedule, not even an intermittent schedule, produces really unstable responding. It's hard to predict what you're going to get with an FR1. It's, it seems to be influenced. Behavior on an FR1 schedule tends to be influenced by a lot of other variables of which we don't know or don't have control. <clears throat> an interesting finding, though, is that if we hold rate of reinforcement constant, ratio schedules produce higher rates than interval schedules. So there's something different about the two. Here is an example of an experiment that I actually conducted in my lab in which we compared variable interval, this is random interval schedules, or variable interval sch schedules. What we were able to do was arrange reinforcement to occur on an interval and a VI30 schedule. Then what we did was we yoked a ratio schedule, it's called, to that interval schedule. So what that means is that if you look at 
where these reinforcer pips occur. They occur at the same point on the x-axis on this schedule, this VR schedule. Although this was a time-dependent schedule, so it's, it depended on the passage of time. If we changed it so that it was dependent on number of reinforcers, or number of responses, you can see that these pips occur at the same point on the x axis or on the y axis but not on the x axis what happens to behavior when it when we turn an interval schedule into a ratio schedule it speeds up what if we take a ratio schedule the time in between reinforcers is the same here as it is here so we turn a ratio schedule into an interval schedule behavior slows down what if we take that interval schedule and turn it back into a ratio schedule bam it flies so you can see that we have slow, steady res responding, very high responding. We take that schedule and make it into an interval schedule, behavior slows down. We take the interval and turn it into a ratio, bam, we're back at a high schedule. So even though we can control this, there's something different about interval and ratio level schedules, interval and ratio schedules. Um, so now what we study are... are uh, we're now putting schedules together, and this is where contemporary research in, in behavior analysis is, in the experimental analysis of behavior, is studying uh, schedule interactions and, and various things. So when we, we, have, we have four options here, <clears throat> we call these things different things. <clears throat> when the schedule enforces an accompanying di discriminative stimulus, or when the schedule enforces not, a signal or does not have a, a discriminative stimulus. That's one dimension that we can manipulate. Another dimension that we can manipulate is that when we put schedules together, transitions can de are, are, are either dependent on the completion of one schedule or they're dependent on time. And we get different arrangements and we call them different things. So a chain schedule is when transitions are dependent on schedule completion and the schedule in force has an accompanying discriminative stimulus. But when the, the the transition is not signaled, we call that a tandem schedule. When transitions are dependent on time and the schedule in force has its own discriminative stimulus, we call that a multiple schedule. When there's no accompanying discriminative stimulus, we call that a mixed schedule. Tandem schedules are completion of one schedule, uh, transitions to another with no accompanying change in stimuli. So we could say we could have a VR20 tandem FI10. Um, these uh, tandem schedules and mixed schedules tend to be often used as control procedures in experiments. Mixed schedules, when one or two or more schedules in effect without a discriminative stimulus, completion of the schedule and force results in reinforcement, but transitions are time dependent. We could have a VR20 FI10 mixed schedule. Again, exactly what this tells us. Generally speaking, we, we use it as control condition. Chain schedules, though, are really interesting. I think we think they have application and, and can help us describe what's going on in the real world. And this is when completion of one schedule transitions to another schedule with accompanying stimulus change. It is held that the transition and change in discriminative stimuli to the second schedule functions as a condition reinforcer for completion of the first schedule. So think about doing your laundry. Is it a chained FI schedule? Um, but we'll get back to that. Multiple schedules are when one or two or more schedules is enforced as if needed by separate discriminative stimuli, but completion of the schedule results in a reinforcer, but transitions are not behavior dependent, rather they're time dependent. No, no responding was necessary for the transition. So it's in multiple schedules that we study discrimination. We train animals to discriminate things. A multiple schedule arrangement is commonly used in discrimination training. How is that done? Well, for example, what we do is, this is a session, for example. So let's say we have a light on, a purple light comes on, and the VI-30 is in force. Then we turn the light off, and extinction is in force. VI-30 is in force with the purple light. Purple light goes off, extinction is in force. VI-30, purple light, extinction, no light, VI-30, purple light, and so on. And what we see over sessions is that the animals come to respond in the purple light and not in... It, the absence of the purple light. We say that the animal discriminates purple from not purple. This is an SD. We could actually call this period, we have a special name for this period, the stimuli associated with extinction are called S-deltas. Um, in my own experiments, um, we, we're, we're studying multiple schedule arrangements uh, right now in which what we have is we have a, a, a schedule called a DRL, a differential reinforcement of low rates, and then we have a VI-30, and the discriminative stimuli are the lever placements. So DR30, DRL-30, we have the left lever, and the VI-30, we have the right lever. 
and we do this for five minutes, five minutes, five minutes, and we'll give them a little break in between with nothing happening. And this is how we've been studying um, uh, a feature called behavioral contrast. Well, I'll get to that in a minute. A VI is a schedule where the first response after a variable amount of time is reinforced. And this produces steady responding. If we decreased the time, uh, if we decrease the VI uh, 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 interval, responding would probably increase a little bit. In this case, the schedule gets richer. DRL is that the first response after a fixed amount of time has elapsed without a response is reinforced. So this is produces slow responding. The animal has to withhold responding for a period of time, and then one response produces a reinforcer. This is called the differential reinforcement of low rates. If we decrease the time elapsed, responding would also increase and in fact, there's the schedule would get richer. We did this experiment where we did many, many sessions where the animals, the rats, would get one session per day. There's a multiple VI DRL. The VI stays the same. It's every day. It's a VI 30. It's always VI 30. It never changes. It was always a VI. It never did anything but a VI 30. The DRL, we started at DRL 30, and after about 30 daily sessions, we changed it to DRL 15. And we ran that for about 30 sessions, and then we changed it back to DRL 30, and we ran that for 30 sessions, then we changed it to DRL 7.5, then we changed it back to 30, then we changed it to 3.75, then we changed it to 15. We did a number of manipulations. Our DRL, what we would predict from this, is that the leanest of the schedules would produce the slowest responding, and the richest of the schedules would produce the fastest responding. And then there would be uh, a sort of gray uh, area. We, we'd get somewhat higher responding in 7.5, um, then 15. 15 would be a little faster than 22.5. 22.5 would be a little faster than 30. We would get this graded responding from slowest to fastest. In the VI30, what we expected was that it's always constant. The reinforcement rate is constant, and the prediction is that the um, that the behavior would be constant, we'd have a constant rate of responding. Again, here is the arrangement. We have five minutes of DRL, five minutes of VI30, five minutes of DRL, and then throughout the experiment we manipulated the value of the DRL. This always stayed the same. We count the responses during DRL, we count the responses to VI, and we plot them. And here is a plot of one animal, and all the animals look like this, and you can see that DRL30 responding is down here. It's very slow, about three responses per minute. We Went to DRL 15, it went up a little bit. Went to DRL 30, went back down. 7.5, it went up. DRL 30 went down. 3.75, it went way up. DRL 30 went back down. This is mm, responding on the DRL schedule. And their values of the DRL changed. This was the richest of the schedule. We, we, we expected it to produce the highest rates of re reinforcement and highest rates of, of responding. These are the accompanying VIs. Wait a minute. Do I have these reversed? No. These are the data. We these is all. This is all VI30 responding. But VI30 responding, the response rate depended on what was going on in the DRL. So one of the factors that affects schedule performance is what's going on elsewhere at other times. And this is a phenomenon we call behavioral contrast, and that is the reinforcement contingencies in one situation affect behavior in another situation, even though there's no direct relationship. If we look back at here, this, this, these VI, this VI schedule was identical to this VI schedule. Why is VI responding so low compared to here? Well, it's because DRL responding is very low uh, uh, in, in respect to DRL responding here. And in fact, it's not DRL responding that is the big deal here. It is DRL reinforcement that's the big deal. The reinforcement rate on DRL is really, really super high here, so um, what we have is low responding on the VI. We call this contrast, and you can apply this. Just think, of, think about this situation. You have two jobs. They're basically the same job. You, you waitress at two restaurants. Uh, you work at two facilities. Then basically the job is the same. In one of those jobs, you get a promotion. How is your behavior at the other job? Does it affect the, your behavior at the other job? In most cases, it does. We think it does. I think it would. I mean, it makes sense to me, and I, I've been in this situation. Here's a case where you got two jobs, and uh, all of a sudden, one of the jobs gets really bad, well, a lot better. The red 
let's say from this transition to this transition versus the blue. Nothing's changed about the blue, but the red job has gotten a lot better. What, this, what happens is your performance on the blue job gets a lot worse. Well, this is a rat. So we think behavioral contrast holds. So there's many other um, factors. This is just one fa another factor, another really interesting factor that affects schedule performance, and that is behavioral contrast. There are other schedule combinations that we can talk about. Concurrent schedules. This is when two or more schedules are operative at the same time. For example, doing laundry and studying, channel surfing, completion of one schedule does not affect the other. You have to choose which schedule to work on. So in behavior analysis, we often study choice with concurrent schedules. Um, this slide uh, basically tells us that concurrent interval schedules are really different than concurrent ratio schedules. Um, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to move on from that um, to illustrate how this might be different. For example, if you have two writing assignments that you're working on, um, or you're fishing, you, if you, you, you can cast two fishing poles. You can take two fishing poles out there and cast them, put them in the ground, and catch fish simultaneously. However, you can't work on two writing assignments simultaneously. We think this is an interval-like schedule, whereas working on two writing assignments is like a ratio schedule. <clears throat> we also study choice um, using a procedure we call concurrent chains, and this is when we have two chain schedules that are concurrently available, and completion of the first link of the chain transitions you to the next link, but eliminates the other option. So for example, you might think of doing laundry versus doing the dishes. You wait, we have two chains. Dishes include a, the, 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 the response chain for doing dishes, in order to do your dishes, what you have to do is you have to make some soapy, warm water. You have to wash them. You have to rinse them. You have to dry them. You have to put them away. Laundry, you have to sort your laundry. You have to wash it. You have to dry it. You have to fold it. You have to put it away. Now, you have to choose which one to do. And doing one likely, most likely precludes the other. Means that if you start doing your laundry, you can't do the dishes because you're at the laundromat. If you start your dishes, you can't really do your laundry because you got to what you're washing and you're rinsing and you're and you're sewing. So uh, concurrent chains are an interesting way to study certain features when we make choices. And it, often what we do is we're in situations where we make choi a choice to do something, and all the other options are gone. You know they sort of disappear. So that's many of the ways that we study. Uh, various factors that affect schedules and um, the complexity of combinations that uh, you can study in the laboratory using different schedule combinations.